Dear, dear all, uh, thank you for attending the lecture uh, entitled Net Art Generations uh, from 1.0 to 2.0 and post internet. Uh, my name is Osman Sarat Karaman. I'm the manager at Digital SSM Archive and Resource Space. And I'm here today serving as representative for the Technological Art Preservation Research Project. Uh, now I want to introduce our illustrious speaker. Uh, we get honored with the presence of Christian Paul. Paul is chef creator and director of the Sheila Johnson Design Center and professor in the School of Media Studies, studies at the New School, as well as adjunct creator of digital art at the Whitney Museum of American Art. She is the recipient of the Toma Foundation's 20. 16 Arts Writing Awards in Digital Arts, and her books are a companion to Digital Arts and Digital Arts, and Context Providers, Conditions of Meaning in Media Arts, and New Media in the White Cube and Beyond. Uh, at the Whitney Museums, uh, Museum, she created exhibitions and is responsible for Artport, the museum's port portal to internet art. And in this talk, Paul will outline the aesthetic and conceptual evolution of net-based practices from Web 1.0 to the current wave of crypto arts, chronicling their engagement with identity, data frameworks, and collaborative production. Also discussed will be the curatorial models for presenting web-based arts over the decades, as well as approach to and best practices for conserving the art form. Uh, the presentation will take uh, one hour and then we will pass the q and session. Uh, please let us know your opinions and questions during the uh, conference. Uh, with that, I want to give, to the, give the floor to Christian. Uh, Christian, please, thank you. Thank you so much, Osman, for the generous introduction and for inviting me here. And thanks, everyone, for attending. And I will now quickly switch and share my screen. Thank you. Sorry, but screen sharing does, despite our previous test, it does. Oh, here we go. Thank you so much. <laughs> Don't know what happened here. All right. So as Osman um, said in his introduction, I'm going to talk about the evolution of net art from 1.0 to 2.0 and the post-internet. And we'll also uh, talk a little bit about curatorial models and preservation I uh, have to give advance notice that I can do all of this only in very broad strokes because I only have an hour and every subsection of this presentation could be a talk of its own. So by the very nature of this presentation, hundreds of artists and shows who would be worth mentioning cannot be mentioned here. I want to start by giving a little bit of background on the evolution of the internet itself and the thinking about web-based browsing and art. So going back to the origins, conceptual origins of a web, one needs to mention Paul Otlet and Henri Lafontaine's Mandeneum, which was founded or created in 1910, conceptualized a little bit earlier. So what they did early on was envision a kind of library that would contain the knowledge of the world and could be browsed by everyone. And uh, a little bit later in the 1930s, Otlet also envisioned these electronic telescopes with, which could be used for browsing information. So conceptually, you had this idea of a web pretty early on. Uh, another kind of predecessor that is often mentioned is Vaniva Bush's Memex, which he outlined in an article he wrote for the Atlantic Monthly in 1945. The Memex, which was never built, is a desk with translucent screens on which you could browse information that would be stored on microfilm. Obviously, this is all a little hard to 
uh, materialize if you envision the materials that you would have access to uh, on the web today. But once again, the thinking about this web-based browsing was there pretty early on. In 1797, after an opium-induced dream and reading about Kubla Khan's summer residence, Xanadu, uh, Samuel Taylor Coleridge wrote his famous um, poem about Kublai Khan, mentioning Xanadu, an un kind of unfinished manuscript. He also forgot certain lines, and uh, Xanadu became the inspiration for Ted Nelson in the 1960s to really envision something that is much, much closer to the web today, uh, thinking about xenological structure, basically a web of documents that would be hyperlinked and links would uh, allow for referencing people collaboratively working on this. Nelson would always say that the World Wide Web is just a pale image of what he envisioned, which is also something that is hard to realize because it would need to allow everyone to have control over the um, documents and be able to link them and build connections, which, of course, uh, we cannot do. So what Nelson envisioned, I think, is much, much closer to Wikipedia. And in that context, I often think of Martin Wattenberg and Fernanda Viegas' wiki history flow, in which they were tracing the changes made to documents and Wikipedia entries by people, similarly color-coded. What you see at the bottom is uh, actually the entry on abortion and the uh, black bars is when the entry was deleted or hacked. But Wikipedia is much, much closer to what Nelson envisioned. So my point just being there was a lot of thinking about these hyperlinked network structures before NetArt 1.0 finally came into being, the first web page was launched in the end of 1990, but the web itself, um, of course, officially came to fruition um, just a couple of years later. And it was a landscape that was really dominated by artists and research institutions. So at that time, we already see uh, a lot of artistic practice and the formation of certain groups, most notably the net.art group within Europe, artists such as Olya Lialina, Alexei Shulgin, Vuk Kozic, Heath Bunting, Rachel Green and others um, collaborating there. And then in the US, you had artists such as Mark Napier and Yael Kanarak, Martin Wattenberg, Maggi Wisniewski. And of course, there was also other practice around the world. There were so many groundbreaking projects created at the time, and I just want to mention a few of them. Olya Lielina's Olya My Boyfriend Came Back from the War was um, a really fantastic and sophisticated for the time exploration of uh, hyperlinked storytelling along with images. And it's a very beautiful fragmentation of a conversation Olya also was groundbreaking in using the browser environment itself for a part of the art, which is occurring in Agatha Appears, which is uh, a conversation between a systems administrator and Agatha, but it really uses the location bar for scene instructions and the browser itself as an environment for storytelling. Vukosic was uh, groundbreaking in creating ASCII art or laying the foundations for that becoming part of net art experimentation. And of course, Jody in so many of their works really stripped the browser environment bare and really brought the back end and the iconography of scripting on the web to the foreground. So these were just some of the pioneers that really changed the landscape. What we also saw early on in the 90s was experimentation with recycling and remixing materials. Amy Alexander's The Multicultural Recycler was basically mixing contents 
from various web cameras and Mark Napier's iconic shredder allowed people to put URLs into the browser window and the corresponding web page was then shredded to uh, once again colorful elements, the HTML that created the page, etc. Also notable were the collaborative environments such as Andy Deck's Open Studio, which allowed people to draw together in a browser environment and the um, early, more sophisticated experimentations with hypertexts and hyper-narratives such as Yael Canarek's World of Awe. And here just a couple of diagrams of uh, the time that outlined the practice, one from Jody and another one which is still used a lot, MTAAs, the art happens here, really drawing attention to that um, basic setup in which the art really occurs within the network and not only on the computer screen at the front and back end. In the mid-90s, there were also several organizations that were being formed, among them Rhizome. I founded together with a colleague at NYU Intelligent Agent, which started out as a newsletter and then became a quarterly magazine. And yeah, El Canarac started the upgrade. Well, this is an announcement for a later uh, kind of event. Yeah, El started uh, the upgrade also first as informal meetings within a pizzeria in the mid 90s. So you already had organizations tracking and paying attention to this. Then in the early 2000s, we make the transition from NetArt 1.0 and 2.0. This graph is from O'Reilly Media, kind of outlining um, major milestones in the transition and what the environment became. And I took the liberty of rearranging this a little bit in terms of certain focus areas from advertising and marketings where page views became cost per click and stickiness became syndication to publishing uh, platforms. Uh, so you had the BBS and mailing lists in web 1.0. Now we have Facebook and Twitter and other platforms that do not exist anymore. The mud smooths and graphic chat rooms of web 1.0 became second life and uh, massive multiplayer online role-playing games. And according to O'Reilly, that you see here under publishing platforms, from publishing to participation. And I would question this a little bit because I think that in some ways the early web was a little bit more participatory while web uh, 2.0 through platforms such as YouTube, for example, returned to ideas of broadcasting. Within the software frameworks, we have a transition also very important to mention from the browser to syndicated platforms and service and database management that we see in Google. And that became the changed landscape for artistic practice on the web. What you see here is a diagram or the homepage view of a Prezi that I created. And you can find that online if you search for it at prezi.com under the upgrade path. And what I did uh, here is contrasting the evolution from 1.0 uh, to 2.0 in three different areas. So um, on the top, in the top bar, you see 1.0, bottom bar is 2.0 in um, the areas of data spaces, identity and cultural production. And I just want to highlight a few of these areas here. So once again, we saw a transition from data spaces 1.0 to 2.0 in artistic practice. In the web of the 90s, we had a whole category of browser art. And many of the works that were created here were really groundbreaking. IOD's Web Stalker, for example, which uh, really allowed you to take a look at the backbone of um, data transfer on the web. It also kind of premiered the idea of a sitemap because you could see 
within nodes what web pages link to and what the connections were. This became a feature that, of course, later on was integrated into many web pages. And then Maggi Wisniewski's Natomat, also very groundbreaking, allowed you through natural language to browse the web, ignoring web uh, sites and pages. It basically streamed back the information. So if you typed in Whitney or searched for Whitney, for example, you would get a mix of Whitney Houston and the Whitney Museum. So really treating the web itself as a database of files. This in 2.0 became much more of uh, an intervention into platforms such as Google, for example. And um, Paolo Cirio, Alessandro Lodovico, and um, Uber Morgan in one of the co collaborations did a whole series of uh, works where they basically interfered in those platforms by, for example, in Google will eat itself being, doing an intervention where you would buy ads through Google AdSense and then invest them into Google stock, basically um, following the idea of Google eating itself you know, through being taken uh, over. Obviously, this is more of a conceptual uh, proposition. And um, that was also followed in experimentation with data frameworks. Once again, I already showed Mark Napier's shredder. He also did Riot, in which you were able to basically put in URLs from three different websites that would then be combined. So really, quote unquote, hacking uh, the defined real estate of several several websites and uh, bringing them together. And you can see um, the second part of the interventions that Ludovico and Chirio did with uh, Face to Facebook as a kind of continuation of that. In that piece, they scraped Facebook, uh, used the profiles of one million users to create um, a dating website, which, of course, stayed online only basically for a weekend because Facebook immediately intervened and the work really became more of a media intervention uh, also at the bottom right seen here uh, as a shot of an installation. And one thing I want to highlight here that is that the uh, kind of practice in the 90s was very, very playful. And so there was an anarchic playful spirit to this. And in the 2000s, you can see this becoming much more aggressive. I don't um, see this necessarily or want to make this sound uh, like it's a criticism or a negative. But as these platforms such as Google and Facebook closed down their back and more and more artistic interventions also became more risky. Um, Chirio and Ludovico, for example, would always work with a team of lawyers because they knew that they would get cease and desist letters, etc. So once again, the corporate platforms from um, Tumblr to Facebook quickly became playgrounds for artistic interventions. Joe Hamilton created his hypergeography on Tumblr, which was a beautiful collage really pushing Tumblr to the limits in terms of what it can do in terms of image aggregation. And Malos de Valks and Eimerick Manzus and De Dave Griffith's Naked on Pluto also was a groundbreaking game intervention into Facebook where you could play a game or interact with um, seven AI bots, you know, basically navigating uh, privacy issues. So we see a lot of uh, artistic engagement also with the locking down of platforms. So on the one hand, in Web 2.0, we have a lot more openness and participation in the sense that uh, everybody has easy access for sharing through platforms, but we also see a lock down on the back end and increasing privacy issues, which we're facing until today. So the landscape profoundly uh, changes. Another um, area that profoundly changed were the MUDs, Moose, and graphic chat rooms of the 90s, which artists 
from the very start used for performative interventions. One example would be desktop theater, which Adrienne Janik and Lisa Brenner is, um, did on the palace graphic chat room. So they would uh, go in and perform, for example, waiting for Godot intervening in those platforms. And it was really interesting to see how people reacted to these impromptu interventions. And then you see con um, continuations of that in uh, online games, Joe Delap's Dead in Iraq, where he, in a performative memorial, read the names of fallen soldiers in the Iraq war, or um, Velvet Strike, which allowed you to basically spray Peace graffiti onto the walls of the game Counter Strike. The artists received a lot of pushback for that. So the intervention, live performative intervention in online games and platforms also changed. Moving on to a different area, identity. Here we also saw a lot of evolutions. So you had in the 90s, experiments such as Keiko Suzuki, the moderator of the 7-Eleven mailing list, which was a fictitious identity impersonated by different people at different points. And a land another landmark project was the website of Mouchette. Yeah. This um, was a site done by Martine Nedem, who impersonated a 13-year-old uh, girl and basically created a whole network of superfans around her. So these earlier experiments would be followed by projects such as uh, Janga's People's Portrait. In 2004, this was an early a project addressing selfies, basically, so online and uh, from various stations in the city, you could upload uh, selfies that would then be shown on massive screens in the city. Also notable here is the connection and transition to a physical environment. And um, then later on, performances by uh, Amalia Altman, for example, on Instagram, also um, a fictitious kind of journey in which she is um, basically pursuing perfection of herself and of her self-representation. So a very different flavor to these projects. Also the early experiments with webcams and See You See Me that you saw in the 90s performances by Tina Laporta, for example, which specifically addressed the delay in uh, webcams were brown groundbreaking at the time. And um, also Jenny Cam, uh, Jennifer Ringley, which really was built as an early performative uh, art project, although it wasn't necessarily meant as uh, such, but the idea of turning the camera on herself at the time was pretty radical. That finds its continuation in much more staged performances in the Web 2.0 area. Uh, Lonely Girl, for example, which was more of a marketing intervention. Uh, you have videos by Petra Courtright on YouTube. And then very famous and radical, a project by Eva and Franco Mattis called No Fun, in which Franco uh, Mattis staged his uh, suicide on Chat Roulette. And the resulting video really shows you the um, net landscape in a very problematic way in the reaction of viewers. So um, some of them really numb and cynical to what is going on here, others deeply shocked. And while it is a radical intervention, I think it also anticipated a lot of the discussions that we're engaged in uh, now in the era of fake truths. When it comes to cultural production in the 1.2 versus 2 point uh, area, you had uh, a few sites in the 90s that allowed people to collaboratively create something on screen. I already mentioned Andy Deck's Open Studio, Mark Napier's Pea Soup would be another example of that kind of practice where 
uh, visitors to the website together could choose sounds and graphic forms and mix them. And due to the development of platforms, this became a more sophisticated practice in the web of 2.0, uh, where you have uh, Perry Bard's basically recreation and re remix of Giga Verdov's only uh, early film, where um, people could basically create their own scenes based on uh, scenes from the movie, man with a movie camera, and then uh, upload them and create a whole new movie scene in contrast to the iconic original. And there also were other um, works such as the Johnny Cash project, uh, frame by frame, um, basically annotation of uh, video to songs by Johnny uh, Cash created by Aaron Copeland and Chris Milk. So the uh, engagement here once again had a different aesthetic to it. I also want to just very briefly comment on the idea of digital labor and activism which saw profound changes. Some of you may remember the iconic toy war of the 1990s. This was something uh, staged by the collaborative eToy, who became um, unwillingly engaged with um, the with uh, a legal battle with the corporation eToys, a uh, toy retail uh, seller who actually tried to buy the domain name from eToy, the um, art collaborative. Uh, preceded, of course, the um, the corporation, but Itoy refused and wanted to hold on to its brand name for artistic practice, which resulted in a lawsuit of the corporation. And Itoy then managed to stage what became known as the infamous Toy War, where people and fans around the world engaged in initiatives launched uh, by them from uh, denial of service attacks and um, other things, which led to a plunge of um, the corporation's uh, stock. And there was this moment where people really thought that harnessing the power of the collective power of the internet could uh, be a potential for standing up to corporations. It didn't quite play out uh, like that, but this was a really a landmark moment in that type of engagement. Compared to that, Aaron Copling's take on digital labor in the 2.0 area is far more cynical. Aaron did a couple of projects, the sheep market and um, 10,000 cents, in which he used Amazon Turks uh, platform where people get paid wages, quote unquote, just in the sense to perform tasks being uh, hired by employers. And Aaron did humorous takes on that in the sheep market where the assignment simply was to draw a sheep uh, left from right. You know, basically the sheep's kind of blindly um, following each other. But once again, we're looking at a completely changed landscape of gig labor, which uh, once again in the 2000 and teens uh, also has profoundly changed. So this is an earlier project. In the 90s, we also had landmark activist interventions such as uh, FloodNet, uh, which was created by the Electronic Disturbance Theater and once again invited people and provided a technological framework for denial of service attacks. Um, this one was um, in the context of the Zapatistas. And I think this kind of intervention and engagement has profoundly changed with social media such, such as uh, Twitter. While the Twitter revolution definitely was corporate branding and a misnomer because the engagement of people in the um, Arab Spring was a lot more complex than that. We see more of a movement to harnessing social media platforms for activism 
that is not necessarily art related. So once again, a profound um, change here in the aesthetics. And this just brief overview, I return to some of the projects uh, later, leads us to the post-internet era. I have a lot of issues with the term of post-digital and post-internet because they suggest a temporality that I think is misleading. We're by no means after the internet or after the digital. I realize that um, what the terms are trying to suggest is that uh, we move to a state of beyond the internet and the web being something new and that we have become accustomed to its language. Yeah. But I think what the terms describe is once again a fairly significant shift in artistic practice. So this article by Ian Wallace also more than misleadingly uh, pronounced a revolutionary new art movement. Post-internet art um, is by no means a movement, I think, but it is a um, different kind of form of engagement and practice that signifies a return to materiality. So just in um, a nutshell, I think what post-digital tries to get at is a condition of artworks and things that are conceptually uh, very much informed by the internet and digital um, processes, taking the language of the network for granted, but they often manifest in the material form of objects. So while the, uh, the internet and digital technologies are used in their creation, they're returning to a form of materiality. So um, the works cross boundaries between media in their uh, final form. Post-digital also describes an embeddedness of the digital in the objects, images, and structures we encounter. So now we have smart homes, smart fridges, we have our Fitbits and um, Apple watches that are constantly reading us and our environment. And um, that really changes the landscape in that we're constantly being seen through digital um, devices. Yeah. Post-digital also embraces a certain kind of fusion of art, commerce, advertising and design. So this condition finds different kinds of expression within artistic practice. So artworks use embedded network technologies and um, reflect back their um, environment surrounding human and non-human environment. You know, the artworks very often reveal their own coded materiality and they reflect the way in um, which those digital machines and processes perceive us and our world. And just a few examples of post-digital work that is material but also uses the network in a different way. Artie Vierkant's image objects are often mentioned in this concept, and these are really prints on dye bond that hang on gallery walls. But these images are changed through engagement via Instagram. So what Artie does in this work is um, basically use uh, photos taken um, by himself and by the public of his work uh, from different perspectives to further alter the UV prints and physical objects that he creates in the work. So the internet becomes a component in these physical sculptures. Another example would be Clement Valla's postcards from Google Earth. So these are found images from Google Earth they are technically not glitches because they are the logical extension of the software in that the photography doesn't quite match the topography of the environment here. And you get these interesting effects. And uh, Clement produced these both as post physical postcards and then also as installations and physical objects that kind of mimic the distortion of the online environment. Another example would be several works by Raphael Rosendahl, for example, Abstract Browsing, which is a plugin which uh, you can uh, use for Chrome. And what the plugin does is basically 
replace all of the images that you see on a given web page um, by these colorful squares, so images and text, and just give, to give you an idea what this was, you know, originally, this web page of cats. But then Raphael also translates um, these images, taking uh, screenshots from the browser plugin on a daily basis into Jacquard weavings, working with a textile museum and returning in these Jacquard weavings to one of the important um, elements of the history of computer art, the Jacquard loom, which is also often mentioned as um, a first form of computer in the sense of an automated um, basically processing of patterns in the creation of textiles. So there's a whole series of these Jacquard weavings connected to that. Another example would be Raphael's um, physical installations of his web uh, project Into Time, which you're seeing right now. So through this, uh, through clicking, you basically are causing this fragmentation of um, the squares, um, very beautiful abstract art experiment. And you might encounter this in an installation as a room size projection on shattered glass or uh, another example would be a projection across sand. So once again, there's a more fluid transition between practice on the web and the way it feeds back into physical manifestations within, quote unquote, real life. I also have to, at this moment in time, I think, say at least um, a few words about NFT um, art and non-fungible um, tokens. I don't know where in the world the audience right now is coming from, but um, in the US there has been an enormous amount of talk about this and I and it has really changed the landscape. I will just rapidly move through this. So non-fungible uh, tokens as crypto tokens that are part of the blockchain and can function as certificates of authentication, basically for um, images online. Just a few basic misunderstandings um, that are part of the hype surrounding NFTs. Uh, we have often heard here in the media that now, for the first time, digital art can be collected. This is, of course, not true. First of all, digital art does not manifest in JPEGs and little animated clips in the first place. That is only a very small fragment of it. But digital art, of course, consists of anything from complex networked installations to VR, AR, etc., NFT art as a term also means a conflation of a sales mechanism with an art form. So what we are ultimately looking at are digital collectibles, little um, images that you can now purchase through uh, NFTs. But once again, an NFT is nothing but an electronic version of uh, the traditional certificate of authenticity and images could have been sold through that. Uh, so we saw this um, much hyped groundbreaking sale of uh, Beeple's work, basically a JPEG for 69 million. And here are a few examples of the types of images you um, would encounter being sold as NFTs. And I just very briefly want to point to the fact that there is a long history of not long, but at least um, seven, eight years of history of crypto art that as opposed to what you currently encounter as NFTs really conceptually engages with crypto. So in 2014 at Rhizome 7 on 7 conference, uh, Kevin McCoy and Neil Dash uh, presented what would ultimately become the monograph platform and was really the predecessor of NFTs. And this kind of uh, token that they envisioned 
was really meant to give artists more leverage in selling their works by also um, embedding a kind of resale function. And Neil recently wrote an article for The Atlantic uh, saying, well, this was not um, supposed to end like this, pointing to the fact that what now is being done with NFTs really is not what they had in mind in terms of support of artists. And I just want to briefly mention a few early uh, projects that engaged with the blockchain and the Ethereum network, one of them, Terra Zero, which was already published in 2016 as a white paper. So um, this, the idea here was to provide automated uh, resilient systems for ecosystems, in this case, um, a forest. So basically the idea of uh, forest managing itself through the blockchain, more conceptual, further field as early as 2017 already published a book on artists rethinking the blockchain. Then we had Larva Labs CryptoPunks also in 2017, these unique uh, characters that are being sold via the blockchain. Julian Oliver early on doing a project that addressed the environmental impact of uh, NFTs and cryptocurrency, um, a work that uses critical en engineering to basically mine cryptocurrency, um, but um, through environmental um, sensors embedded in wind turbines. Then we had Crypto Kitties, which I think got the most attention and really put this idea of uh, crypto and uh, crypto games and art on the map. And uh, Jonas Lund in 2018, also fairly early on, started experimenting uh, in this realm by basically allowing uh, curators and shareholders to become part of his artwork by um, using tokens to basically vote on how what shape the work might take, for example, in an exhibition. So I was part of this network and we would vote online for different manifestations of the work, different kinds of installations. So this more of a curatorial experiment, Jonas also recently released a token in connection to it. And then we also um, already had exhibitions devoted to this, for example, at um, ZKM, which did an exhibition called Crypto Art Playground, also a few years ago. I want to mention another um, few examples that play with ownership, collectorship, and donorship. 89 Seconds Atomized would be one of them. This is a work by Eve Sussman, in which Eve basically broke down her video 89 seconds at Alcazar into um, little pixels or atoms that you can purchase through the blockchain. So all of the collectors would need to come together in order to completely screen this piece as part of an exhibition. And in 2019, I commissioned a work for the Whitney Museum's Artport website called Public Key, Private Key by Jennifer and uh, Kevin McCoy. And what Jennifer and Kevin did here is experiment with donorship. They gave a 16 millimeter film as a gift to the Whitney embedded in this film, which um, shows an actress walking up uh, stairs you find um, keys for a token, basically. And on the web, the McCoys then opened up an, a process of application, a call for applications for donorship of this work to the Whitney Museum. So people could apply for being a bon donor. The McCoys then selected 50 donors which officially at the museum became the donors uh, on record. They can still trade uh, and sell their tokens. Uh, but it was very interesting to um, see how much interest there was in this collective donorship 
while donorship is something that is usually reserved for the more wealthy patron. So all of these were really um, experiments over time that give you a much more complex idea of what crypto art um, can be. And yet one other example where I see potential is artists creating spin-offs of larger works through um, uh, tokenized work. Uh, this is Western Flag which is part of a token related to John Gerard's much larger video installation. If we have time, we can discuss all of this more in the Q&A. So I also want to briefly go through models of exhibiting net art. Once again, I could talk for hours about this. So this will be just a very sketchy survey bringing up certain scenarios. But I think it's... Um, particularly important to mention this and get to this in the time of the pandemic, where the idea of online exhibition has experienced even more categoric instability than it did before through this move to an expanded post-digital internet art. So online exhibition right now has a little bit diluted what we thought of um, as such, um, right now, what you would encounter as part of online exhibitions is, of course, not only net art, but a lot of physical representation of uh, or representations of uh, work in physical space. So exhibitions of net art happened early on. Uh, browsing here is this really nice timeline of uh, exhibitions that Corey Archangel and others uh, put together that gives you a really nice overview of all of the practices that have happened. In 2007, Franz Thalmeyer stated that it is easier to get an entire museum collection on the internet than to get a single exhibition of internet art in a museum space, which I very much agreed with, and it's still very complicated. So I'm going to start with exhibitions of net art in physical space. What you see here is the earliest work of net art in the collection of the Whitney Museum, Douglas Davis's The World's First Collaborative Sentence from 1994. And on the left, you see how this work was exhibited at Lehman College's uh, art gallery as a printout of the first contributions to the sentence, which is basically just an HTML form where people can endlessly add to a sentence. So here you simply have a printout. In 2001, I um, curated an exhibition called Data Dynamics, in which I showed web-based art as physical installations. And I just want to briefly draw attention to the apartment, let me go back for a second, Martin Wattenberg and Marek Wolczak's apartment, which you see in this image in the background. And here on the top left of your screen, you can um, see a sketch for the work. Without getting into it, there was a 2D and 3D component to it. And in this scenario at the Whitney, we showed the 2D component as one user station where people through input of words could create a blueprint of an apartment and then image searches would be performed to create the 3D apartment you see in the background. But over time, this work has been exhibited in radically different ways. Uh, on the right, you see how it has been exhibited most in uh, a tail version where you just experience the 2D component or in a much more complex installation at Ars Electronica, where you have a user table for input showing the 2D and 3D side by side. So once again, a certain kind of instability of what the work is in this translation into physical space. I um, just want to briefly mention a couple of pieces that I showed in programmed a huge exhibition at the Whitney Museum that I co-curated with Carol Mancusi Ungaro and Clemence White. Um, so this exhibition really traced the origins of programmed art through conceptual art and then uh, through the manipulation of video sequences. 
And just an example of two work of a couple of works that were originally uh, um, commissioned for the Artport website, but shown as installations. One of them, Marc Lafia and Fang Julin's The Battle of Algier, which is based on Gillo Ponte Corvo's documentary film. So the artists um, basically broke down the whole film into little video snippets. Um, the film, which you may be aware of, um, kind of created a fictionalized scenario um, around the battle of Algier, looking at the French authorities and the National Liberation Front resistance. And in this work, you have the video clips associ associated with the um, resistance and with the French authorities as little cells that move uh, according to different rule sets. If you encounter this online at Artport, uh, as you see in the screenshot here, you get um, introduction on the screen, you get instructions on the um, screen, and then you have at the um, bottom a menu where you can launch the info and help. You get you can draw um, the A and F cells and clear everything. And we basically remodified this whole interface for the installation in physical space where you can interact through an iPad embedded in a bed pedestal. The instructions are on the pedestal in this scenario. And as you can see at the bottom, we created um, an altered kind of interface, you know, drag the grid to move um, and simplified it in various ways for on-site interaction. So a modification of the work for that. Another example from that exhibition would be Casey Rea's software structures in uh, which he really tries to point to the connections between software art and conceptual art of artists such as LeWitt. And here you have one of the um, instructions created by Casey in two different variants. And what you're looking at right now is how you would encounter this work on the Artport website for which it was, the Whitney's Artport website for which it was originally commissioned. But in the exhibition space, we showed this as large scale projections next to each other and for legibility also flipped the um, background, which Casey is completely fine with. It's part of the work that is that it is flexible in that way. So very different uh, rendition. I also want to briefly mention the art happens here, curated this by Rhizome. So an exhibition of um, basically works that were preserved through Rhizome's net art anthology. Um, series, which I'll talk about a little bit later. And what I want to draw your attention to, once again, the inspired by this net art diagram that I showed, showed earlier, is that um, Rhizome decided to basically present the works on older machines and uh, screens that really captured the environment of their creation. So here the physicality of the show also very much references the timeline at which this was created. Um, another uh, kind of setup for exhibitions would be the purely online one. And uh, you had early sites, notably Ada Webb and Gallery 9 at the Walker Art Center that started working with that. And I also want to mention runme.org, the software art repository that allowed people to submit works, which were then kind of screened a little bit by a team. But this is also an example of kind of open curation by the public. Um, um, Rhizome continues online exhibitions through its series First Look. And I have since 2001 been uh, curating works for the Whitney's Artport website. So there are more than 100 uh, projects by now that you uh, can explore there, some of them non-functional, of course. 
And I just want to briefly mention the Sunrise Sunset series, which is a separate series on Artport because of its time-based intervention. So what this work, um, this series does is uh, basically hand over the whole websites to artists for 30 seconds at sunrise and sunset time in New York, where they are displaying an artwork being overlaid on whitney.org. And the latest one is a work by La Turbo Avedon, Morning Mirror, Evening Mirror, which I think nicely um, references or reflects on pandemic time, because you see this uh, mirror that presents you with fly-throughs of a 3D apartment that La Turbo constructed. So you have seven different fly-throughs here at morning and evening time. And it exists at this threshold of um, basically looking into somebody else's place as we do through Zoom windows or reflecting back our own space. So this as a time-based intervention. And I have to speed up a little bit since I'm running uh, out of time. Uh, an example of distributed online exhibitions would be the recent show We Link Sideways, curated by Zhangga for the Kronos Art Center. And um, I just want to mention it because this work, uh, this exhibition exhibited works at the website, but also collaborated with numerous institutions showing part of the works on their websites, um, either mirroring the or linking to the whole show or um, showing works from Artport's uh, Sunrise Sunset series. So this is an interesting experiment with distributed shows. And now I just very briefly want to talk about what we have seen during pande pandemic times in a return to basically simulations of physical environments. In the 1990s, we saw a lot of museums experimenting with basically representing the museum space online in 3D architectures. And we quickly learned that this was not necessarily the best way of presenting work online. During the pandemic, we have really seen a return to that kind of skeuomorphic representation of space. But I think that some artists have also used this in very interesting ways. And one example would be Claudia um, Hart, who did an exhibition called The Ruins, at Bitforms Gallery, once again, without getting too deeply into the work itself, which basically um, addresses the decay of modernism through modifications and experiments with work by Matisse and um, Picasso. The work existed within physical space and simultaneously on Mozilla Hub. So you see the installation at Bitforms here, and then really a replica of it in Mozilla Hubs. But I think here you have a very different rationale for this virtual physical kind of presentation because the exhibition on Mozilla Hubs is not simply a simulation and replica, but can in some ways be seen as the origins. The wallpaper you're looking at here, for example, was created virtually first through complex modeling. So what Claudia is um, doing here is really showing these side by side. And then um, finally, within um, this area, I want to uh, show a clip and brief fly through from restart an exhibition that Julie Walsh curated. And here you are looking once again at a show within a virtual platform, uh, Mozilla Hubs, but the work you're encountering exists in very different media. So right now we're looking at documentation of an AR work, Liberty Bell by Nancy Baker Cahill, or what is shown as an installation um, by Tammy Cotill in physical space. So here you have a complete, uh, complete mix of realities. And I think all of these experiments have made the idea of the online exhibition much more unstable as a category. I believe there's a lot of confusion about that. 
So I have a whole little section also about um, net art preservation. And my question here is um, to the organizers whether it could, should continue for a few more minutes or stop it here for discussion. You can, you can go, Christian, uh, please. Okay, so I very quickly go through this uh, too. Once again, net art preservation, something that I could talk about for um, hours. What is important here, and I'm sure we'll discuss this a little bit more, is the idea of capturing, capturing context and records of context, because net art is, of course, deeply uh, contextual. We have seen numerous preservation initiatives over time. I think we are in very good shape when it comes to models and best practices. There have been symposia organized by the Guggenheim in caring for software-based art or the Tate. Then the um, Upper Rhine Valley in Germany did um, also a massive initiative on digital art conservation with accompanying show at ZKM. Artists such as Rafael Lozano Hammer have developed best practices for conservation of media art from an artist perspective, specifically geared towards collectors. So I think on that level, we have made um, a lot of progress and artists are becoming much more savvy about this. And of course, in your um, own series here, uh, basically featuring and talking to a lot of the people from Tate, from Rhizome, we have this distribution of knowledge across um, platforms. We have also seen more and more tools from the variable media questionnaire, which I think was very helpful in outlining what we need to think about in the preservation of net art and digital art to um, tools such as Rhizome's Conifer, which allows you to create archives of web pages. Really important if you want to document something like um, performances on social media platforms, also emulated legacy browsing, allowing you to look at websites through browsers or emulation as a service are notable here. So once again, the variable media qu questionnaire with its different categories and Rhizome actually did um, conservation through this archiving of um, social media, in this case, Instagram for Amalia Alman's excellences and um, perfections. Just a few shots from that work. And I think emulation of particularly um, early works will become more and more prevalent as we move into cloud-based emulation. I hope that in the future we'll, we'll be able to visit older net art pieces in their native um, environment. So I think we have made a lot of progress here. And I also want to mention Rhizome's landmark project, the Net Art Anthology, in which they really uh, retold the history of net art through 100 projects. And once again, really providing context for those pieces, which I think is so crucial. So while we have more sophisticated tools today, what is really missing is that organizations and museums make a commitment to um, basically doing this through collecting uh, net art. The Whitney Museum did a preservation um, effort on the world's first collaborative sentence uh, in which we created two different versions of Douglas Davis's uh, work because the original featured a lot of broken links. And our question was, hmm, do we keep those links broken, showing that the net is and the web is this ephemeral environment or do we link to the internet archive and basically bring up those pages again? And we decided to go with two versions, one of them uh, leaving the links broken and the other one linking back. And of course, we also made the piece functional again. And to close, I just want to um, briefly talk a little bit about what the Whitney has been uh, doing. The Whitney has formed partnerships for preservation through its media uh, preservation initiative. 
and Artport has also worked with a few partners. We have been regularly communicating with Rhizome, but also collaborated with the Computer Science Department and the Institute of Fine Arts at NYU to engage in preservation. So students from these institutions have for the past few semesters done code analysis and documentation of Artport works. I just want to mention a piece by Barbara Latanzi, C-SPAN times four, which is particularly tricky to preserve. I think decisions about how to best preserve a piece of net art have to be made on a case-by-case basis. And we had a lot of discussions with the artists about how to best approach this. But a crucial first step in doing this really was um, the analysis of the code and of the architectures which we have been engaging in. So the Media Preservation Initiative at the Whitney has um, two integrated preservation and access platforms, Archivematica, which really automates conservation tasks, and then the research space, which really allows us as curators and others to access all of that um, research. And I'm going to end it right here and looking forward to further discussing. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. Uh, thank you very much for this comprehensive and very well prepared presentation. Uh, now uh, we can pass the Q&A session. And uh, dear participants, please let us your opinions and questions. And um, please let me uh, want to start with my question. <laughs> this is also my research question. Yeah. Um, the challenges posed by the conservation of internet artworks are not only linked to the technological changes. And mm -hmm. The end of an artwork's life could be due to the nature of the work. Mm -hmm. The notion of uh, conservation cannot be limited to passing on the work in, into the future as is, updating it with new technologies or as a recreation. If a work needs to stop and by its very nature, what could we retain about these works in the future? Uh, for this reason, uh, I think of all um, internet artworks as more of performances. Uh, performances uh, that uh, last years and that keep going. And what is your opinion, uh, Christian? Can you think the internet artworks as performance artworks? I believe that the answer, the answer will be a guide for digital art conservation practices. Yeah, um, and I didn't have um, a lot of time to get into this idea of performativity. I just touched um, upon it in various ways. So as you say, what really distinguishes net art is also its performativity. Um, that brings it closer to um, performance art and the fact that it is so context-based. Nevertheless, I think we need to make decisions on a case-by-case -case basis here because some of the works are, you might say all internet art is performative in one sense because we are activating it in the browser, no matter how confined it is. But at the same time, I would say that some works are more performative than others by, the, by their very nature. So I think what we need to do is twofold here. Mm -hmm. I think we cannot simply um, lock in on what has been done in the context of performance art, where basically you have video recordings of the work that then enter yeah. collections and then it becomes restaged. But we have to think about it in a slightly different way because we also have different um, technologies at our disposal. So institutions with many of these um, works that rely on input and activation have sometimes even for more than a decade created snapshots and archives of what is going on. Um, a good example, which I didn't mention in my presentation, would be uh, Lynn Hirschman's Agent Ruby, 
where SF MoMA has a whole archive of conversations with uh, Ruby that also has been exhibited. Yeah? So I think keeping a record of this is incredibly important. I think we need to pay a lot of attention, um, attention to the context of the web, of browsers, of really the state in which a work has been created, all of which in a nutshell means a lot more work for a curator and conservator. And definitely not, I think some things are meant to die and have been created to die. That was always the case for performance art too. But in general, I'm definitely not in the camp of saying, oh, it's all ephemeral, just let it go. Because it is also a rich history. And talking to students over decades and works while I watch their eyes glaze over because they cannot picture what the hell I'm talking about you know, is not an ideal scenario and I'm deeply grateful to what Rhizom has done for example through emulating these works and being able to bring them to a public. So in a nutshell I think it's still important to make decisions on a case-by-case -case basis and in terms of performativity we need to um, pay a lot more attention to context and preserving and archiving context. Yeah, maybe uh, maybe um, we need to uh, think uh, the documentation differently in this uh, uh, connection. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, another question. Uh, first of all, thank you for such a good presentation. Um, question is related to sustainability. Do you think that digital art could be in the future absolutely sustainable? Thinking that internet is actually one of the most energy consum consumers, uh, this question. Um, so this is more about env environmental sustainability than, I guess, than the, the work itself. Mm. I just answer both, <laughs> just <Yeah>. in case. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, I mean, on the one hand, the survival of digital art and net art, as I just very briefly pointed out, really relies on institutions and organizations making more of an effort to um, chronicling the medium and preserving it. In terms of environmental um, sustainability, this is such an important question, and I think this is such a crucial moment in time. We are working, you know, on, you know, initiative um, countering climate change and getting rid of fossil fuels. And at the same time, we are creating uh, energy guzzling AIs and the recent NFT craze in particular yeah. is a, a great example um, of this. You also, within the NFT context, you have... Um, the distinction between proof of stake networks, which are much, much more um, energy efficient, still not solving the problem and proof of work. So I think proof of um, work platforms are problematic and artists shouldn't um, flock to them. Um, within AI, we already see a lot of movement towards more sustainability. I believe that it would be possible um, working with um, solar and really science coming up with new uh, methods of harnessing energy. You know, for example, also the heat produced through, um, let's say, AI networks and using that energy again to make things sustainable. And I think we really need to focus on this right now. Otherwise we find ourselves at this idiotic kind of um, transition point where we get rid of fossil fuels increasingly while really pumping up our consumption of um, electricity. Uh, another one, uh, what do you see in the future of NFT? Yeah, this is another question. Yeah, so once again, <laughs> NFT is consuming all of them. It's the, um, it's the same here. You wouldn't believe how many, uh, you know, NFT talks and <laughs> conversations I have, um, just on a weekly basis. So I am hoping that the hype will die down, um, pretty fast. 
what I think is unfortunate is that we are currently riding the coattails of, NF of crypto entrepreneurs who are pushing this for their own sake. Um, as I mentioned, I have seen a lot of potential from the start in the, um, in the kind of proposals that Kevin McCoy and Anil Dash and Monograph as a platform made early on for um, artists to make more, to be able to create more sophisticated contracts and having resale um, clauses. Right now, the smart contracts of NFTs are very generic and not really helping, but many um, smart people are developing more smart contracts. I think if we can change the idea of, for example, resale and artists getting kickback um, on sales, of having preservation and artists' rights more encoded into smart contracts, that would be, uh, is a terrific opportunity. I'm also confident that we could find more sustainable um, models for this. I think we have to understand that NFTs ultimately are really nothing more than glorified certificates of authenticity. Yeah. And what many people do not realize, depending on the platform, is that they really just buy a certificate of authenticity while not at the same time uh, receiving an actual work. I know this varies from platform to platform, but we have to be very careful um, about this. And we have to make sure that the understanding of digital art in all of its complexity doesn't get diluted. So I think there is a lot of potential in NFTs for broadening collector base, for um, making a lot of um, progress here. But right now we are caught in a hype that um, works against us. Thank you very much. Um, another question, <laughs> again, feature <laughs> about feature. What will be NetArt's 3.0 or 4.0? Well, I think what we will see really is um, a continuation of this kind of expanded internet art that we have um, been experiencing in a progression from the uh, odds of the 2000s and through the teens. And this is in sync with um, digital technologies in our life, basically. So in the 90s, we still had much more of a separation of, oh, here's the web or the internet, and here's the physical world. The two of them have become so much enmeshed, of course, that you can't quite think them without each other. And that has, as we have seen, influenced practice on the web a lot. We still see, of course, practitioners who are um, working with pure net art only. But I think the practice has broadened a lot and we will see it broadening um, in terms of intersections between the physical world and um, the network world. That will definitely um, continue. I also think that through the pandemic, we have seen once again more of a move to virtual worlds and social spaces, virtual worlds. I think that will probably also change the future of exhibitions. You know? more experiments with that kind of um, format. I think there are still, I'm not sure how much the idea of the online exhibition will be permanently diluted through this, because right now we see so many different forms of work moving um, into online spaces. You know? But I think that kind of more social practice also connected to VR, VR chat, for example, you know, uh, experiences of virtual worlds through your headset from home, all of that will be the definitely be one of the futures for artistic practices. Thank you, uh, Christian. I think that uh, we have no more questions now. Uh, I please, I need to check. 
Yeah. We Do have you have any final yeah, no, no more questions. <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Christian. Uh, I'm very happy for your contribution to our projects, uh, research projects. And uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks so much for the opportunity. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Have a, have a Bye, nice everyone. Time.